We're here. We are here. We are back. We are forward. We are whatever you want us to be. Good evening. Oh, God, my neck is killing me. Um, you know, sometimes uh, you, that there's an old expression about how, you know, people fall asleep and they wake up and they've got bed hair and I have bed neck bed head um, nothing works right everything bends wrong uh, anyway um, so if I look kind of ow like I'm doing this a lot I am that's that's absolutely happening <laughs> my neck is killing me um, other than that no real issues good to see you I will be reading in just a matter of moments my name is Tad I write books um, and in this particular setup here um, I actually read books and for various reasons, I read almost entirely from my own, although we may do something about uh, about changing that again on Halloween. I don't know. I think last year I read some other stuff. Actually, it's been several Halloweens now, so maybe I've done something every Halloween. I can't remember. Um, anyway, so in just a few minutes, I am going to be reading. Um, before that, um, 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 uh, I'm going to be doing what? I'm going to be telling you I'm here. I'm going to be telling you that things are pretty much the way they always are. Um, busy, Zoom, going, of course, a lot of family stuff because uh, we've gone through a lot of family stuff this summer. And that's all still ongoing um, in terms of just having to travel around and all that. I was saying last night that um, our poor dog, our big dog Johnny, hates it when he sees the suitcase come out. Um, in the past, it always meant I was going away to travel, you know, for a couple of weeks. And even though these are much shorter trips, I am going over a lot to my parents' house. And uh, as a result, Johnny is in a constant... St and Oh, and Deb is sometimes, too. So uh, one of us is almost always going out the door. And uh, so Johnny is very nervous and upset about this. And when, when we are home, and especially me, because I'm kind of his primary parent, I guess, um, or his pack leader, as the case may be. Whenever whenever I'm home, Johnny just gets right up on top of me and kind of sits on me and wants to know where I am at all times. And um, if I get up and, and walk around, uh, you know, he will get up with me. I mean, dogs tend to do that anyway. You know, that's, that's, that's the thing I always loved about dogs, how they just think every idea you have is brilliant, you know? And so you get up and they're like, wow, we're getting up. Oh, and then, you know, you go off and get a drink of water and you get back and get back onto the bed or whatever. Oh, back on the bed? Man, how do you think of these things? You know, they're just, they're dogs, you know, they're dogs. So um, the, uh, <laughs> the poor guy is just really, you know, messed up. The, the other one, the small the other one, the small one, Chihuahua Walter, is not as freaked out. Although he's a little freaked out too. He doesn't like it much when when we go anywhere. Um, they, you know, they're both dogs. They they want their pack there, and we already had two of uh, the young people move out this summer, and they still haven't gotten over that. You know, they're still waiting at the door frequently to see when those young people are coming back. I haven't had the heart to tell them that they're actually going to go and have an adult life. Um, and probably will never move back. But, uh, you know, when I see them sitting there waiting, I just tell them, oh, could be today. Never know. Anyway, so meanwhile, I am just working on the last thrashing bits, as I keep telling you, because it keeps going on, the last thrashing bits of Navigator's Children, which is now approaching a thousand pages in manuscript. Um, which means that I think the two manuscripts combined uh, now for, for Navigator's Children into the Narrow Dark, which was originally going to be one book, is now longer than Two Green Angel Tower. So even more unlikely it would have made one book. I think that the manuscript of the previous one was like 800 and something, and this one's almost 1,000. So, oh, God help me. Um, I don't know why this keeps happening to me. Um, I keep writing these... No, I know exactly why it's happening, so don't worry. I'm just, uh, um, there. there's just, oh, oh, it's just too complicated for words. But it, it basically is that, um, you know, I know exactly why these things happen. It's because I write books 
where I insist on creating ancillary characters and then feel like I owe it to the readership to give those ancillary characters their own arc. So when you have 20 focal point characters or whatever it is, and each one has their own arc, and you have to make all those arcs sort of all come together, um, finishing a book is interesting. It's a challenge. And that's always been true, especially with these multi-part things for me. Um, and uh, I'm not complaining. You know, it's it's the way I write. And it's become clear to me that you know, there's there's a lot of value that comes out of it. There's a lot of emergent uh, order and and emergent stuff that you hadn't expected that comes out of these really long books and characters that you had no idea were going to be in the book become, you know, a major part of the story and sometimes even kind of take over parts of the story or change parts of the story. So, um, you know, I, I, I choose to do these and I will probably always, although I will also write shorter books, I will always go back to writing big long things just because it's something that I do and something that I enjoy. And to be honest, something that I think I'm good at. Certainly I'm better at finishing these kinds of things than a lot of people just because I've had more experience than most people <laughs> because I've written so many damn long series. Um, anyway, enough bibble babble. Um, I'm going to say hello to the people who are here who have checked in. And uh, which, by the way, if you are a new listener or watcher or viewer, audience member, friend, whatever, um, you are always welcome to come and drop a hello. And I will say hello to you until it gets to the point where that would dominate. But since our, our group is usually fairly intimate, it's not an issue. So anyway, let me check in and see who's here. There's Ray on the top of the ch chat stream and saying greetings. And I say greetings to you, Ray. And Kelly, good evening, good evening. Lori, good evening to you. Claudia, evening. Carl, hello, good evening. All is as well as it can. Yes, indeed, that is absolutely true. Barb Ann, good evening. Good to see you. Penny, hello. Ron, hello, buddy. Good to see you. James, just started Empire of Grass for the first time. Oh, cool. Good. I hope you like it. Kristen, hello. Glad you're back. Ian, remember that 2001 reading at Our House in the Redwoods? Um, yes, absolutely, I do. I'm glad you enjoyed that. As I recall, our beagle um, went and uh, basically from person to person, our beagle Sherman, our beloved beagle Sherman, um, now 10 years gone, um, Pretty much tried to hump every single person who was there, uh, if if I'm remembering the the occasion correctly. Um, it, Sherman was a wonderful dog. We loved Sherman. He was he was just uh, one of those dogs you just sort of never get over. When when he was young, it's just really funny because you don't think of him. I never thought of him as a primarily a cute dog. He was a very big beagle. He was a bicolor beagle, which means he only had red and white instead of red, white, and black, or red or tan, white and black. He was just the tan and the white. Um, and he was big for a beagle. I mean, he was like 38 pounds or something. And, you know, you, if I don't think beagles could even be shown in official dog circles unless they're like 28 or less or something. So he was gigantic. I mean, he was a brute of a beagle. Um, but he was the most secure in himself uh, of any animal or person I think I've ever met. Uh, we used to kind of marvel at it, you know, that he just had no sense of anything other than he was Sherman and the world revolved around him and that was as it should be. Um, and uh, to this day, I mean, it's, it's you, 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 politics will show you that if somebody just believes in themselves, even if they're nuts, a lot of people will agree with them. Um, and Sherman believed in himself very clearly, but unlike the politicians, he, he was not nuts. He genuinely was a fabulously cool dog. But when he was a puppy, we used to take him like over to the mall where we lived um, and we could never do it. We could get like a hundred yards maximum into the mall and we were stopped so many times by people, kids, grown-ups wanting to pet him because he was just so adorable um, that we just gave up taking him with us when we went over there, even if even though it was a chance to give him a walk so, you know, I could walk him while Deb was shopping or whatever. 
but we just couldn't do it because he just sent out this vibe of I am Sherman come and appreciate me come and worship me I am worth your time um, anyway I don't know why I'm talking about a dog that we lost 10 years ago but anyway oh because we were talking about that thing in 2001 so yes I believe that that was one of the occasions where Sherman introduced himself to everybody's legs uh, <laughs> I'm sure in a, in a way that made everybody kind of feel honored, <laughs> knowing Sherman. Anyway, good to see you, Ian. James, I already said hello. Jared, hello, hello. Um, I'm, I'm glad you find me entertaining or this entertaining. Uh, I, I think you probably need to get out more if this is your idea of entertainment, but I'm happy to provide what I can. Uh, so thank you. Good to see you, Jared. Soren, hello. Soren says, I just started reading your work this year and uh, it's an inspiration. I wanted to ask about the giant wheel in Tigat. There is some kind of symbolism there, but I am just missing it. Am I wrong? Well, I my books are rotten with foreshadowing and dream images and, you know, symbolism of many kinds. As you will notice, um, if you we're listening to, or if you listen to the previous broadcast from what I read last night, there Simon has his first wheel dream, and the wheel can represent many things. And in classic imagery, the wheel represents um, obviously things like time, the cosmos, you know, the 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 circularity of existence, the uh, wheel of rebirth. I mean, there's all these things, but. In Simon's case in particular, um, the wheel also represents the idea of the past coming back to the present. And in the bit I read last night, he had a, a dream or a vision or whatever of being caught by the wheel, being snagged by the wheel, carried up into the air and then smashed down into the ground. And what that was meant to be symbolic of is the idea that in this particular place and time, namely in the story in Ostenard, um, that the past is beginning to creep up from under the present and to affect and even interfere with the present and threatens perhaps even to supplant the present. And that's what Simon has dimly perceived a few times going back to the very beginning of the story when he thinks he hears Sithi voices after Morganes has first told him about the destruction of Azua, which was what was what's under the hayhold, the, the old Sithi um, palace. And uh, so I would say that's the primary thing. But then without giving anything away for those who maybe haven't read the books, um, there's a very specific foreshadowing in the wheel that obviously comes up in Two Green Angel Tower. But I would say that's the primary symbolism. Um, Tiffany, hello, first time commenting, watching from Florida. Well, hello, Tiffany, great to have you. I hope you are not in the part of the state that is currently flooded and um, I, I obviously send worried vibes for everybody who is having to put up with that and uh, I hope you are in better shape than that and are safe and warm and dry. Tracy, hello, wishing me massage. Oh, bless you. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I could too. I wish I could hire some gigantic Swedish guy who would stand behind me and squeeze all of the weird pinchy bits out of my neck right now. So as it is, I may just sit here like Igor in the Frankenstein movies. Um, so anyway, hi, Tracy. Good to see you. Deborah, hello. Thank you, thank you. Susan, hello, and thank you. And good to see you, Steve. Good evening, good evening. Tim, good evening. And watch last night's reading. If you need next weekend, I'll repeat it. But if you don't, oh, yeah, because I mentioned, thank you, Tim. That's a helpful thing. I mentioned I don't know what's going to happen next weekend because I am kind of house-sitting with my dad at his house and um, next weekend. And because of that, I don't know what the, what the state of the broadcasting is going to be like because I haven't done a reading from there. Um, so I don't know how good his Wi-Fi is. I don't know if it can carry the bandwidth necessary, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's what I was saying last night to the folks who showed up 
was that I will try and advise everybody ahead of time what's going to happen. I am, if I have my druthers, I will be, in fact, um, doing my regular reading. But it depends on whether the physical facilities are up to it. So that's that message. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Tim. Um, and wishing me, Tim is wishing me and everyone else, Canucks or not, an early Canadian Thanksgiving. Well, thank you back. And we appreciate it. And early Canadian Thanksgiving to you too. Um, I told you I used to live with a Canadian family. Um, they were lovely, lovely people. They were they were Saskatooners or Saskatoonians or Saskatoonites or just Saskatoons, you know, like like uh, Roger Rabbit. I, I don't know. But anyway, they were lovely people and uh, I still miss them. Haven't seen any of them. Last one I saw was daughter Katha and that was years and years and years ago, although we have been Facebook friends. Um, anyway. Yeah, I'm rambling tonight. If I'm going to get to the reading, I better move on here. So what am I doing? Okay, so that was Tim. Okay, Tim, thank you. Good. Hello, Matthew. Good evening. Family and I are doing as well as can be expected. Um, thank God for senses of humor. M my family, we all have senses of humor. We married um, people, women in our case, uh, with senses of humor. Um, and... <laughs> You know, we, that's all you can do. When something grim and heartbreaking happens, if you don't have your sense of humor, there's not, you know, you, there's no other way to react really that to deal with life except just to be miserable. So we have our dark senses of humor and we're going with the flow as best we can. So we're, we're, we're doing pretty well. And again, it's a, a large amount of credit goes to my brothers who are, you know, have been just sterling during the whole thing, both of them. And, uh, you know, just the, the joy of having such good people to go through bad times with. I can't say joy in the sense like I choose to, because God, no, would never choose to go through this. But, um, you know, the, the, the fact of having such excellent companions in the foxhole, um, you know, is a blessing. I guess that's a better way to put it. Jeremy! You were sleeping again last night at 1 a.m. Ah, Jeremy, I'm really disappointed. Tiffany says, the longer you spend in Ostenard, the better. It's a haven of mine. Oh, that's not an unpopular opinion. If that were an unpopular opinion, I would have been writing shorter books a long time ago. Um, a lot of my readers like the long books. And it's just that from a, a as I get older, from a work point of view, it's just ridiculous because I'm selling just a moment of practical analysis here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not literally selling them myself, obviously. Someone's doing that for me, the publishers in whatever country. But the books themselves, they're basically charging the same cover price for a thousand page manuscript that they would for a 300 page manuscript. But it takes me three times as long to write a book like that or three times as much labor. So it's a really stupid thing from a business point of view. Um, that's, you know, to be very clear, that kind of consideration never comes into the whole thing. When I Once I start a story and I know it's a long story, then it's a long story and that's all there is to it. I don't say, oh, well, I should save my working time by making the book shorter. No, um, I will occasionally deliberately start short books because they feel like short stories or shorter stories. But it is, I care, every now and then I look at this and I think, you know, I could have had 70 books in print by now instead of 25 or 26 or whatever I've got. Um, you know, so just from a purely practical point of view, this, this reading, this writing really long books thing is stupid. But I don't write to make money. I write because I write and because I want to tell stories. And I just pray that I can find enough people that I can continue to feed and house my family, including my very, very bad pets, um, which unfortunately I am also contractually obligated to feed and house as well. So yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know when they got me to sign that. I completely missed it. I think they might have snuck in when I was asleep and forged my signature on it. Anyway, so thank you, Tiffany. I will probably still continue to crank out the, the, the 
odd, very long story. Um, Kristen says, plots that grow excessively. Yes, absolutely. Although the plots themselves are not primarily the main issue. It, it's mainly the fact that there are so many characters. And, and, and I do that on purpose. Don't, this is not a complaint. You know, I deliberately want to have many character viewpoints because I'm trying to create a more kaleidoscopic view of what's going on. I don't want just the, the narrative authorial voice telling everybody. I want many different characters observing and the reader then sifts through those viewpoints and decides what is most valid or what is about the thing they're most interested in. And that's, you know, how they assemble, just like the way we assemble information in the real world and decide what to believe and what's going on. Anyway, uh, Lori very kindly asks, how is my dad? Dad's doing okay. You know, dad lost his, his partner of 62 years. So he's not obviously very happy, um, but it's also really hard to tell with my dad because he's a science guy and he tends to be fairly, not unresponsive, but he's not a talker, um, which, you know, the rest of the family, certainly my mom and my mom was, and my brothers and I are. And dad is much more the type that you say, dad, do you think X, Y, Z or Z, Y, X? And he'll say, hmm, a little of both. You know, and that's like, that's as much information as you're going to get out of him. He's not somebody who elaborates or anything. So it's hard to tell exactly, but he's doing okay under the circumstances. And we're all spending a lot of time with him. And, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out, he, he doesn't probably want to stay in the house, in their house, um, you know, which has also been their house my whole life because they moved there when I was very young. Um, so we're trying to figure out what he's going to do next and, well, we're trying to figure out what he wants to do next and then, you know, help him do so. Anyway, Michelle, hello. Thank you for checking in. Lisa, just received your special edition Tell Chaser song. Excellent. Sounds good. Um, yeah, they're gorgeous books. Pierre, hello. Okay, Igor, all the best from Croatia. Hello, Croatia. I've had two lovely trips to Croatia, and I intend to come back again. Madardo, Melardo, Landon, Maza, Dueñas, amigo mío. Bienvenidos a nuestra presentación. I've lost my Spanish accent. Bienvenido a nuestra presentación. There, that's better. Slightly, anyway. Sean, it's October. Am I scared of anything? Yeah, I'm scared of October. Uh, because after October comes November. And you know what comes after November? The flippin' holiday season. Yeah, I'm terrified. V, V Moir Kasparik. And I, well, I, I, we hope I, you p pronounce the soft C. Um, in Dearborn, Michigan. Hello, hello, Michigan. That's another place I haven't been for a while. Mike from Idaho. You know, I don't think I've ever been in Idaho, Mike, although we have friends there. Um, and I and I know Mike. So, hey, I better go. Uh, see, Anita Nunez. Hello, hello. Hey, all. First time I'm able to watch the stream, finally escaping an evil schedule, a procrastination distraction, and oh, shit, I missed it again. Greetings from Santa Barbara, where it's cold, foggy, and damp. Anyway, well, lovely. Santa Barbara is a very nice town. Um, I've haven't been there for a couple of years, but uh, deliberately stop there when we can because we like it and because it's a cool place to wander around in the downtown and pretend like we are wealthy Californians instead of being just regular Californians. But no, Santa Barbara's gorgeous and uh, sorry the weather is crappy at the moment, but that will change, I'm sure. And Carl, Wikipedia says 29 books plus one in the works and some comics. Okay, well, Wikipedia knows more than I do. Virtually everybody does, but Wikipedia certainly does. Um, and, okay, so I think I've said hello to everybody, and I've spent a really, really long time talking, as usual, like halfway into the broadcast, however. So i got to continue <clears throat> with my reading. Okay, last we saw the uh, Simon and Binnebeck and the slightly unpleasant uh, brother Hengfisk and uh, Langrian was, um, they, they were all uh, in the ruins or, or outside the ruins of St. Hotterans and they were 
they were finding out once Langrian had sort of awoken, Brother Dacaius, the other one who had been uh, in bad shape, died. But Langrian recovered enough to say that the um, there had been two groups and one group had fought the other. One group was a Rimmersman and the other was somebody else. And the Rimmersman had been attacked and basically that's what had happened. And that's how the uh, St. Hotterad's Abbey had been burned down. The services for Dulcais were brief and spare. Hengfisk had found a winding sheet in the ruins of the abbey. They wrapped it around Dulcais' thin body and lowered him into a hole the three able-bodied folk had dug in the abbey's cemetery, while Langren slept in the forest with Kantaka for a guardian. The digging had been hard work. The fire in the great barn had burned the wooden handles from the shovels, leaving only the blades to be wielded by hand, straining, sweaty work. By the time Brother Hengfisk had completed his impassioned prayers, coupling them with promises of divine justice, seeming to forget in his fervor that Dochaius had been far away from the abbey when the murderers had done their work, it was the darkling tag end of afternoon. The sun had dropped until there was nothing left but a bright residue along the crest of Vine Hill, and the grass of the churchyard was dark and cool. Binnebick and Simon left Hengfisk crouching at the graveside, goggle eyes tightly shut in prayer, and went to forage and explore around the abbey lands. Although the troll was careful to avoid as much as possible of the scene of the tragedy, its results were so widespread that Simon quickly began to wish he had returned to the forest camp to wait with Langrian and Kantaka. A second hot day had nothing to, done nothing to improve the condition of the bodies. In their bloated, swollen pinkness, Simon saw an unpleasant similarity to the roast pig that crowned the Lady Day table at home. A part of him was scornful of his weak-heartedness. Hadn't he already seen violent death? A battlefield full in a few short weeks? But he realized as he walked, trying to keep his eyes ahead, to avoid the sight of other eyes glazed and cracked by the sun, that death, at least for him, was never the same, no matter how veteran an observer he had become. Each one of these ruined sacks of bone and sweetbreads had been a life once, a beating heart, a voice that complained or laughed or sang. Someday this will happen to me, he thought as they threaded their way around the side of the chapel. And who will remember me? He could find no ready answer, and the sight of the tiny field of grave markers, their tidiness cruelly lampooned by the sprawled bodies of slain monks, offered him little comfort. Binnebeck had found the charred remnants of the chapel's side door, areas of sound wood showing through the coal black surface like streaks of new cleaned brass on an old lamp. The troll poked at the door, knocking loose burned fragments, but the structure held. He gave it a more vigorous poke with his stick, but still it stuck closed, a sentry who had died on watch. Good, Binnebeck said. It is suggesting we may wander inside without the whole structure crashing upon our heads. He took his stick and poked it in through a fissure between door and frame, then used it like a mason's pry bar, pushing and levering until, with a little help from Simon, it sprang open in a shower of black dust. <coughs> After working so hard to open a door, it was truly strange to enter and find the roof gone, the chapel as open to the air as an unlidded cask. Simon looked up to see the sky framed above him, going red at the bottom and gray at the top with the onset of evening. Around the top of the walls, the windows were blackened in their frames, the leading twisted outward, spilling its sooty glass as though a giant hand had pulled off the roof, reached down through the beams, and poked out each window with a tightened finger. A quick survey turned up nothing of use. The chapel, perhaps because of its rich draperies and hangings, had burned to the walls. Crumbled ash, crumbled ash sculptures of benches and stairs and an altar stood in place, and the stone altar steps bore the ghost of a floral wreath, a perfect 
impossibly delicate crown of paper-thin leaves and diaphanous gray ash flowers. Next, Simon and Binibic made their way across the commons to the residences, a long, low hall of tiny cells. The damage here was moderate. One end had caught fire, but for some reason had burned out before the conflagra conflagration had spread. Be looking especially for boots, Binibic said. It is sandals these abbey wet men wear mostly, but some of them may occasionally need to ride or travel in cold weather. Some that are fitting you are best, but in necessity settle for too large rather than too small. They started at opposite ends of the hall. None of the doors were locked, but they were distressingly bare little rooms. A tree on the wall, the only decoration in most. One monk had hung a flowering rowan branch above his hard pallet. Its jauntiness in such spare surroundings cheered Simon immensely until he remembered the fate of the room's resident. On the sixth or seventh, Simon was startled when his pulling open the cell door was followed by a hissing noise and the blur of something whisking past his ankle. At first he thought an arrow had been shot at him, but one look at the tiny empty cell showed the impossibility of such a thing. A moment later, he realized what it was and quirked his mouth in a half-smile. One of the monks, no doubt, in direct contravention of Abbey rules, had kept a pet. A cat, no less, just like the little gray scattercat he had befriended at the hayhold. After two days locked in the cell, waiting for the master who would not return, it was hungry, angry, and frightened. He went back down the hall looking for it, but the animal was gone. Binibic heard him clomping about. Is all well, Simon? He called out of he called out of sight in one of the other cells. Yes, Simon yelled back. The light in the tiny windows above his head was quite gray now. He wondered if he should head back to the door, finding Binibic on the way, or go back and look some more. He was interested at least in examining the cell of the monk with the contraband cat. A few moments later, Simon, Simon was reminded about the problems about keeping animals shut in too long. Holding his nose, he looked quickly around the cell and spotted a book, small but nicely bound in leather. He tiptoed across the suspect floor, hooked it off the low bed, and stilted out again. He had just sat down in the next cell to have a look at his prize when Binibic appeared in the doorway. I am having small luck here. You? the troll asked. No boots. Well, it, it is fast becoming evening. I think I should be having a look around the traveler's hall where the murderous strangers were sleeping, in case there is some object there that will tell us anything. Wait for me, here, hm? Simon nodded and Binibic left. The book was, as Simon had expected, a book of the Adon although it was a very expensive and finely made book for a poor monk to have in his possession. Simon guessed it was a gift from a rich relative. The volume itself was unremarkable, although the illuminations were very nice, at least as far as Simon could tell in the fading light. But there was one thing that caught his attention. On the first page, where people often wrote their names or words of salutation if the book was a gift, there was this phrase, carefully but shakily written. Piercing my heart, there is a golden dagger. That is God. Piercing God's heart, there is a golden needle. That is me. As Simon sat looking at the words, his newfound resolve was tested. He felt a wave washed through him, a staggering ocean breaker of remorse and fear and a feeling of things that, though unseen, were nonetheless slipping heartbreakingly away. In the midst of his staring reverie, Binibic popped his head through the door and tossed a pair of boots onto the floor beside him with a muffled clatter. Simon did not look up. Many interesting things there are at Traveler's Hall, your new boots not least, but dark is coming, and I may take only a moment more. Meet with me before this hall, soon. And he was gone again. 
After long, silent moments in the troll's wake, Simon set the book down. He had planned to take it, but had changed his mind, and tried the boots on his feet. At other moments, he would have been pleased to find how well they fitted, but now he just left his tattered shoes on the floor and walked down the hall toward the front entrance. The muted light of evening had descended. Across the common stood the traveler's hall, a twin to the building he had just left. For some reason, the sight of the door across from him, swinging listlessly to and fro, filled him with vague fear. Where was the troll? Just as he remembered the swinging paddock gate that had been the first signal that all was not well at the abbey, Simon was startled by a rough hand grasping at his shoulder, pulling him backward. Bit a bit, he managed to shout, and then a thick palm was clamped over his mouth, and he was crushed back against a rock-hard body. Where is the kinder? A voice growled at his ear in the stony accents of Rimmer's guard. Im totzen Kruger, another voice sneered. In a blind panic, Simon opened his mouth behind the shielding hand and bit. There was a grunt of pain, and for a moment his mouth was free. Help me! Bit a bit! He screeched, and the hand covered him again, crushingly painful now, and a second later he felt a black impact behind his ear. He could still hear the echoes of his cry dissipating as the world turned to water before his eyes. The door of Traveler's Hall swung and Binnebeck did not come. Chapter 21, Cold Comforts. Duke Isgrimner of Elvritzala had put a little too much pressure on the blade. The knife leaped from the wood and nicked his thumb, freeing a sudden stripe of blood just below the knuckle. He fumed a curse, dropped the piece of heartwood to the ground, and stuck his thumb in his mouth. Flecke is right, he thought. Damn him. I'll never have the knack of this. I don't even know why I try. He did know, though. He had convinced old Frecke to show him the rudiments of carving during his virtual imprisonment at the hayhold. Anything, he had reasoned, was preferable to pacing about the castle's halls and battlements like a chained bear. The old soldier, who had served the duke's father, Isbjorn, as well, had patiently shown his Grimner how to choose the wood, how to spy out the natural spirit that lurked inside, and how to release it, chip by chip, from the prisoning grain. Watching Frecka at work, his eyes nearly shut, his scarred lip quirked in an unconscious smile, the demons and fish and lively beasts that climbed into being from beneath his knife had seen the inevitable solutions to the questions the world put forth. Questions of randomness and confusion in the shape of a tree limb, the position of a rock, the vagaries of rain clouds. Sucking on his wounded thumb, the duke toyed in a disordered way with such thoughts. For all Frecke's claims, his Grimner found it damnably hard to think about anything at all while he was carving. The knife and woods seemed at odds, in pitched battle that might elude his vigilance at any moment to slide over into tragedy. Light now, he thought, sucking and tasting blood. His Grimner sheathed his knife and stood up. All around him his men were hard at work, cleaning a brace of rabbits, tending the fire, getting camp ready for the evening. He moved toward the blaze, turned and stood with his broad backside to the flames. His earlier thought of rainstorms came back to him as he looked up at the rapidly graying sky. So, here it is, Maya month, he mused, and here we are, less than twenty leagues north of Urchester, and where did that storm come from? At the time, some three hours gone, as Grimner and his band had been in hot pursuit of the brigands who had waylaid them at the abbey. The duke still had no idea who the man had been. Some of them had been countrymen, but none had familiar faces or why they had done what they had. Their leader had worn a helmet in the form of a snarling hound's face, but his Grimner had never heard of such an emblem. He might not have even survived to wonder, 
but for the black-robed monk who had screamed a warning from beneath the St. Hodderin's gateway just before toppling with an arrow between his shoulder blades. The fighting had been fierce, but the monk's death, God's mercy to him, whoever he was, had served notice, and the duke's men had been ready for the attack. They had lost only young Hove on the initial charge. Einskaldir had been wounded, but killed his man anyway, and another beside. The enemy had not been looking for a fair fight, as Grimner thought sourly. Faced by his Grimner and his guard, fighting men all and itching for action after months in the castle, the would-be ambushers had fled across the abbey commons to the stables, where their horses were apparently saddled and waiting. The duke and his men, after a quick inspection, found none of the monks alive to explain what had occurred, had resaddled and followed. It might have been more politic to stay and bury Hove and the Hotterundans, but his Grimner's blood had been fired. He wanted to know who, and he wanted to know why. It was not to be, however. The brigands had gotten a start of some ten minutes on the Rimmersmen, and their horses were fresh. The Duke's men had sighted them once, a moving shadow sweeping down off Vine Hill onto the plain, heading through the low hills toward the Weldhelm Road. The sight had filled his Grimner's company with new life, and they had spurred their horses down the slope into the valleys of the Weldhelm foothills. Their mounts seemed to have caught some of their excitement, drawing up reserves of strength. For a brief while it had seemed that they might run the waylayers down, coming on them from behind like a vengeful cloud rolling across the plain. Instead, a strange thing had happened. One moment they had been rolling along in the sunlight, then the world had grown perceptibly darker. When it did not change, when half a mile later the hills around them were still lifeless and gray, his Grimner had looked up to see a knot of steel-colored clouds swirling in the sky overhead, a fist of shadow over the sun, a dim, grumbling crack, and suddenly the sky was spilling rain, a splatter at first, then torrents. Where did this come from? Einskalder had shouted across to him. A hissing mist now pulled like a curtain between them. His Grimner had no idea, but it had troubled him greatly. He had never seen a storm come up so fast out of a relatively clear sky. When a moment later one of the men's horses had slipped on the wet, matted grass and stumbled, throwing its rider, who... Thank the Adon landed safely. His Grimner raised his voice and bellowed his troops to a halt. So it was that they had elected to make camp, here only a league or so from the Weldhelm Road. The Duke had briefly considered going back to the Abbey, but the men and horses were tired, and the blaze that had been roaring from the main buildings when they rode off suggested there would probably be little to go back for. Wounded Einskalder, however who, though his Grimner knew better, sometimes seemed to possess no emotions save for a general fierceness, had ridden right back to the abbey for Javi's body and to pick up anything else that might give a clue to the attacker's identities or motivations. Knowing Einskalder and his ways, the duke had given in quickly, stipulating only that he must take Sludig along, who was a slightly less ardent spirit. Sludig was a fine soldier, but nevertheless valued his own skin enough to provide some counterweight to bright-burning Einskaldir. So, here I stand, his Grimner thought in tired disgust, baking my bum in front of the campfire while the young men do the work. Curse age! Curse my aching back! Curse Elias! Curse these damnable times! He looked down at the dirt, then stooped and took up the piece of wood lying there, which he had hoped some miracle would help him shape into a tree to lie against his wife Gutrun's breast when he returned to her. And curse carving! He gave it to the flames. He was tossing rabbit bones into the fire, feeling a little better for having eaten, when there came a sudden roll of hoofbeats. His Grimner dropped his hands to wipe grease on his kirtle, and his liegemen did the same. It would not do to have a slippery hand on axe or sword. It sounded like a very small company of riders, two or three at most. Still, 
No one relaxed until Einskalder and his white horse came clear against the twilight. Sludig rode just behind, leading a third mount, across whose pommel were draped two bodies. Two bodies, but as Anskalder explained in his terse manner, only one, a corpse. A boy, Anskalder grunted, his dark beard already shiny with rabbit fat. Found him nosing about. Thought we should bring him along. Why? His Grimner rumbled. He doesn't look anything but a scavenger. Einskalder shrugged. Fair-haired Sludig, his companion, grinned affably. It hadn't been his idea. No houses around. We saw no boy at the abbey. Where did he come from? Einskalder cut loose another piece with his knife. When we grabbed him, he yelled for someone. Bena or Binak. Couldn't say for sure. As Grimner turned away to briefly survey Harvest's body, now laid out on a cloak. He was kin, the cousin of his son Izorn's wife. Not close kin, but close enough by the customs of the cold north that his Grimner felt a deep pang of remorse as he stared down at the young man's snow-pale face at his thin yellow beard. From there, he turned to the captive, still bound at the wrists, but lowered from the horse to lie propped against a rock. The boy was only a year or two younger than Hove, thin but wiry, and the sight of his freckled face and shock of reddish hair tugged at his Grimner's memory. He could not summon the reminder forth. The youth was still stunned from the tap Einskalder had given him, eyes closed and mouth slack. Looks like any poor peasant lout, the duke thought, except for those boots, which... A wager he found at the abbey. Why, in the name of Mamer's fountain, did Einskalder bring him? What am I supposed to do with him? Kill him? Keep him? Leave him to starve? Oh, let's get to finding rocks, the duke said at last. Hover will need a cairn. This looks like wolf country to me. Night had come down. The outcroppings of rock that dotted the desolate plain below Weldhelm were only clumps of deeper shadow. The fire had been stoked high, and the men were listening to Sludig sing a bawdy song. His Grimner knew only too well why men who had been blooded, who had lost one of their own, Hove's undistinguished pile of stones was one of the shadow clumps out beyond the firelight, might feel the urge to indulge in such foolishness. As he himself had said months ago, standing across the table from King Elias, there were frightening rumors on the wind. Here, on the open plain, dwarfed but not protected by the looming hills, things that were travelers' tales in the Hayholt or Elvitzhala, ghost fables to enliven a dull evening, were no longer so easy to brush aside with a laughing remark. So the men sang, and their voices made an off-key but very human sound in the night wilderness. And, ghost tales aside, his Grimner thought, we were attacked today, and for no reason I can fathom. They were waiting for us. Waiting! What in the name of sweet Eusiris does that mean? It could have been that the brigands were merely waiting for the next group of travelers who might stop at the abbey. But why? If they were only after robbing and what not, why not pillage the abbey itself, a place likely to have at least a fine reliquary or two? And why wait for chance travelers at an abbey in the first place, where there would naturally be witnesses to any act of thievery? Not that we've got many witnesses left, damn their eyes. One, maybe, if that boy proves to have seen anything. It just did not make good sense. Waiting to waylay a company of travelers who, even in these times, might prove to be king's guardsmen, who had, in fact, turned out to be armed, battle-honed northerners. So the possibility had to be entertained <clears throat> that he and his men had been the targets. Why? And just as importantly, who? Is Grimner's enemies... Scully of Kaldskrike, being a prime example, were well known to him, 
and none of the bandits had been recognized as members of Scully's clan. Besides, Scully had gone back to Kaldskrag long ago, and how could he have known that his Grimner, sick to death of inactivity and fearing for the safety of his duchy, would, would decide at last to confront Elias and, after an argument, receive his reluctant royal permission to take his men north. We need you here, uncle, he told me. He knew I had stopped believing that long ago. Just wanted to keep his eye on me, that's what I think. Still, Elias had not resisted anywhere near as strongly as the Duke had anticipated. The argument had seemed to his Grimner only a matter of form, as though Elias had known the confrontation was coming and had decided to accede already. Frustrated by the circles of his, that his thoughts were following, his Grimner was about to lever himself up and off his bedroll, off to his bedroll, when Freca came to him, the fire at the aged soldier's back making him a gaunt, sh shambling shadow. A moment, your lordship? His Grimner suppressed a grin. The old bastard must be drunk. He only got formal when he was in his cups. Freca? It's that boy, sire, the one Einskalde brought back. He's awake. Thought your lordship might like to chat with him. He swayed a little, but quickly turned it into a gesture of pulling up his breeches. Well, I suppose. The breeze was up. His Grimner pulled his kirtle tighter and started to turn, then stopped. Frecker? Lordship? I threw another damned carving in the fire. I expected you would, sire. As Frecka wheeled around to head back to the beer jug, his Grimner was positive the old man wore a tiny smile. Well, damn him and his wood, anyway. The boy was sitting up, chewing the meat from a bone. Einskaldir sat on a rock beside him, looking deceptively relaxed. His Grimner had never seen the man relax. The firelight could not reach Einskaldir's deep-set stare, but the boy, when he looked up, was as wide-eyed as a deer surprised at a forest pond. At the duke's approach, the boy stopped chewing and regarded his Grimner suspiciously for a moment, mouth half open. But then, even by fire glow, his Grimner saw something pass across the boy's face. Was it relief? His Grimner was troubled. He had expected... <coughs> he had expected, despite... Un Excuse me. <coughs> He had expected, despite Einskalder's suspicions, the man, after all, was as prickly with mistrust as a hedgehog, to find a frightened peasant boy, terrified or at least dully apprehensive. This one looked like a peasant, an ignorant cotsman's son in tattered clothes, covered in dirt, but there was a certain alertness to his gaze that made the duke wonder if perhaps Einskalder hadn't been right. Here now, boy! he said gruffly in the westerling speech. What were you doing poking about the abbey? I think I'm going to slit his throat now, Einskalder said in Rimmersback, pleasant tone in horrid contrast to his words. His Grimner scowled, wondering if the man had lost his mind, then realized as the boy continued to stare blandly up at him that Einskalder was only probing to find if the boy spoke their tongue. Well, if he does, he's one of the coolest wits I've ever seen, his Grimner thought. No, it beggared imagination to think a boy this age in the camp of armed strangers could have understood Einskalder's chilling words and not reacted at all. He doesn't understand, the Duke said to his liegemen in their Rimmersgard tongue. But he is a calm one, isn't he? Einskalder grunted an affirmative and scratched his chin through his dark beard. Now, boy, the duke resumed, I asked you once, speak, what brought you to the abbey? The youth lowered his eyes and set the bone he had been gnawing on the ground. His Grimner again felt a tug at his memory, but still could summon nothing. I was, I was looking for, for some new shoes to wear, the boy gestured to his clean, well-cared-for boots. The duke picked him out by his accent as an Urkenlander, and something more. But what? 
And you found some, I see. The duke squatted so that he was at eye level. Do you know you can be hanged for stealing from the unburied dead? Finally, a satisfying reaction. The boy's heartfelt flinch at the threat could not have been studied, his Grimner felt sure. Good. I'm sorry, master, I didn't mean any harm. I was hungry from walking and my feet hurt. Walking from where? He had it now. The boy spoke too well to be a woodsman's brat. He was a priest's boy or a shopkeeper's son or some such. He'd run away, no doubt. The youth held his Grimner's stare for a moment. Again, the duke had the feeling the boy was calculating. A runaway from a seminary, perhaps, or a monastery. What was he hiding? The boy spoke at last. I, I, I have left my master, sir. My parents, my parents apprenticed me to a chandler. He beat me. What chandler? Where? Quickly? Mo Malachias, in Urchester. It makes sense, mostly, the duke decided, except for two details. What are you doing here, then? What brought you to St. Hodron's? And who, is Grimner lanced in now, is Benna? Benna? Einskaldir, who had been listening with half-closed eyes, half closed eyes, leaned forward. He knows, Duke, he said in Rimmer's back. He said Benna or Binak. That's sure. How about Binak, then? His Grimner dropped a wide hand on the captive's shoulder and felt only a twinge of regret when the boy winced. Binak? Oh, Binak's my dog, sir. Masters, actually. He ran away, too. And the boy actually smiled, a lopsided grin that he quickly suppressed. Despite his misgivings, the old duke found himself liking the lad. I'm heading for Naglaman, sir, the boy continued quickly. I heard the abbey fed travelers like me. When I saw the, the bodies, the dead men, I was scared. But I needed some boots, sir, I truly did. Those monks were good Adenites, sir. They wouldn't have minded, would they? Naglamund? The duke's eyes narrowed, and he sensed Einskaldir grow a little more taut, if such a thing was possible, at the boy's side. Why Naglamund? Why not Stancha or Hasuvel? I have a friend there. Behind his grimner, Sludig's voice rose, careening through a final drunken chorus. The boy made a gesture in the direction of the fire circle. He's a harper, sir. He told me if I ran away from Malachias to come to him and he would help me. A harper? At Naglamund? His Grimner stared intently, but the boy's face, though shadowed, was as innocent as cream. His Grimner suddenly felt disgusted with the whole business. Look at me questioning a Chandler's boy as if he had been single-handedly led the ambush at the abbey. What a damnable day it has been. His Einskalder was still not satisfied. He bent his face close to the boy's ear and asked in his heavily accented speech, What is the Naglamund Harper's name? The youth turned, alarmed, but seemingly from the sudden proximity of Einskalder rather than the question. For a moment later, he blithely responded, Sangfugel? Fredia's paps! His Grimner cursed and climbed heavily to his feet. I know him. That's enough. I believe you, boy. Einskalder had turned away, pivoting on his rocky seat to watch the men laughing and arguing at the fire. You may stay with us, boy, if you like, the Duke said. We will be stopping at Naglamund, and thanks to those Horse and bastards, we have Hovis horse going riderless. This is hard country for a stripling to cross alone, and these days it's near as much as slitting your own throat to travel out of company. Here, he walked to one of the horses and pulled the saddle blanket down, tossing it to the youth. Bed down, wherever you like, as long as it's close in. Easier for the man standing sentry if we're not strung out like a flock of straying sheep. 
He stared at the thistle-down hair starting out in all directions and the bright eyes. Einskalde fed you. Do you need aught? The boy blinked. Where had he seen him? In the town, probably. No, the boy replied. I, I was just hoping that that Binnick will not get lost without me. Trust me, boy. If he doesn't find you, he finds someone else, and that's a fact. Ein Skalder had already slipped away. His Grimner stumped off. The boy curled himself in the blanket and lay down at the foot of the rock. And even though I should be stopping there, eh, no, that's like four pages. That'd be another 15 or 20 minutes. Um, at the rate I go. Okay, we'll have to put it off. I apologize for talking through so much of the, what should be the reading part of the uh, the reading part of the reading. <laughs> God, I'm useless. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm going to stop there for now. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I promise I won't talk quite as much at the beginning next week. Um, but again, as I mentioned, oh, that reminds me, or I have reminded myself, um, I don't know for certain what's going to happen. So check in on my social media and, and such like, um, because I will need to uh, find out. I'll have to test the, the Wi-Fi over at my parents' house and see how it works with the broadcasting software I'm using and things like that. So um, check and see. Uh, if possible, I will be doing a reading and uh, we will be reading some very exciting stuff. Exciting stuff is coming. Um, so let me know uh, if you let me know. What's that mean? Um, I will let you know if I can <laughs> check with me and I will let you know if I can do my reading next week. Um, I imagine I will be able to one way or the other. So um, until that point, thank you for joining me. Continue to be good to each other. Be good to your loved ones and friends and relations and neighbors and even Alexander Beadle. And I will see you very soon. I will see you next week probably. And until that point, take good care of yourselves and peace. And I'll see you soon. Thanks. <laughs>